Hi everybody, Father Alex here. Welcome to another episode of the Godcast. My guest today on the Godcast is Reverend uh, Sophie Cowan, who is a uh, who is a priest in the Church of England. And we're going to be talking to her about all things uh, urban ministry. If you enjoy the interview, then please do follow me on X at uh, Alex at Alex DJ Frost, or subscribe to my YouTube channel, or maybe even check out my book Our Daily Bread from Argos to the Altar: A Priest Story, which is available online and in all good bookshops but for now uh enjoy this interview with reverend sophie cowan well i'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the godcast this week is reverend sophie cowan who is a priest within the church of england sophie it's great to get you on how are you i'm good thank you thanks so much for having me here it's it's great to get you on now. I'm just going to say from the outset that people who might be watching this around the time that this is being uh, recorded, which is November 2024, there's lots of noise uh, going on within the Church of England, particularly around the resignation of the Archbishop of Canterbury. But uh, we think Sophie and I think there's enough uh, stuff out there for people to consume at the moment. Uh, so we're going to really focus on uh, what we're here to talk about, which is really about urban ministry so there's plenty out there I've, there's podcasts i've done around that subject so but uh, sophie and i have got something else to talk about so let, let's get on sophie and, and do that first of all sophie uh you will be familiar to people in in your local context but but for listeners and viewers tell us a bit about about yourself and where you are and, and what kind of setting you're in yeah great so um i'm priest in charge at st mary stoke in ipswich and it's a mixed context. It's kind of urban, um, but it's not a city, obviously. Uh, we've got two estates in our parish um, and some other um, more kind of wealthy housing <laughs> on one side. Um, and that's, you know, this is my first post. So um, I've, I have one of those um, ministry division funded poster, posts, which means that I've got five years funding to be here. Uh, which is amazing in a sense, you know, it means that a state ministry um, has been funded by the central church, um, but also it means there's that lack of kind of stability, security, which I think is particularly important on estates. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and and what about your your own calling, Sophie? Have you been uh, an aspiring priest for many years? It was, did the call, well, you are young anyway. I mean, people who are watching this will see that, but just tell us about your calling, if you would. Yeah, I mean, well, firstly, I want to say I love the title of your book. Um, <laughs> the reference to Argos is brilliant. Um, I am from Corby in Northamptonshire. Um, and Corby is, um, or and certainly has historically been a financially deprived area. Um, from council estates in that area. I grew up on council estates, lived on council estates, love council estates. Um, and I owned a fancy dress shop. So, um, you know, we probably sold similar things at some point. <laughs> oh, gosh, and uh, a little fancy dress shop. Um, my fancy dress shop started with a Prince's Trust grant. So I started that out of uni. And um, but it didn't really, it was, didn't work out financially. So I ended up working in social housing. So I was never really like planning to be a priest. It wasn't, um, you know, I was part of the church, but I was, you know, a helpful member rather than um, expecting to be called to ordination. Um, uh, when I did get the call or when I felt called, it took a long time of discerning that um, I was 26. Um, so took a little bit of time to kind of work out and also it was just a big surprise like you say some people know from a young age but that wasn't me so uh, yeah we we took our time working out as a family I thought you I thought you were gonna say so for you were working in the fancy dress shop and you saw a, a priest vicar's costume in the corner and you thought I could do that <laughs> no that's not quite what happened um <laughs> no um it yeah it it's it there are strange crossovers, you know, um, there's definitely like that kind of seasonality um, that happens in a fancy dress shop, uh, you know, going through the seasons and noticing them um, for different reasons. Uh, but no, I, it was it was kind of um, that sense of knowing that I needed to do something else all the time. And um, I did a history degree like that's what I did out of school, still paying for it. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it wasn't. I, I knew there was something, but it wasn't quite clear to me. And when I worked in the council, I joined a Christians at Work kind of group. 
Uh, and that, along with my, you know, being part of the parish church, really directed me to kind of prayerful consideration of what what might God be calling me to. Um, and I think I hadn't until then really thought anything about being ordained or or any of that stuff or any kind of the politics of the church of what it might mean to be a woman to be ordained. Um, and so I kind of set aside this time during a bit of a crisis point. So I had a fancy dress shop closed. We had 3000 costumes. They were all in my house, my little like semi detached ex council house. <laughs> and uh, I had a two year old running around and I was working for the council. And um, it was a really important role in um, social uh, housing, looking at housing applications and matching them with the law and, and looking at who was, you know, suitable and so on. Um, but it was really tough because of the right to buy and the lack of housing provision and just the decisions we had to make were really hard. And sometimes I felt they didn't match with my what was going on for me and my faith. Mm. So it was that kind of crisis point in my life, felt like a crisis point. I had a lot of debt from the shop, like a lot of debt. And it was um, just very, very stressful. And I thought, what can I do but pray? So I spent two weeks praying diligently, asking God, you know, what is your plan for me? Like, what can I do? Do I just work in the council and pay this debt off? Um, and then uh, I came across an article, which is a bit random, but it was like the 10 happiest jobs. Um, <laughs> so bizarre. Um, and I went through the list in my head going, no, 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 all the way down to the 10th, which was um, monk slash priest. <laughs> and, um, and I felt like, I'm a bit charismatic, very charismatic. So I felt like overcome by the Holy Spirit. So I felt like elated and it was weird because I was in a very low point in my life um, and I felt elated and I felt like I'd burst and I thought this is so weird. Um, and is this from God? Then I quickly Google, can women be priests? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like maybe if God had said minister or like something, maybe if the word had been minister or something, then, you know, but it was priest. So you know, and I, and as I discerned it over the kind of three years, it became clearer and clearer to me that that's what God was calling me to do, and and the church recognised that too, um, you know, through the back process and and discernment with the DDO. So, you know, very. I think sometimes God can be very random. Um, uh, certainly in my life, I, that's been the case, and uh, I I know this is what I'm called to do, as hard as it is. Um, I can never deny that time. Um, one of the things that happened when I spoke to my husband about it was that he was like, you, this is, you're under too much pressure. Like this is, you know, surely just spend some time thinking about it. Um, and he's particularly concerned about the debt. Um, and um, we had one of those miraculous moments where we just dis decided to discuss it. And on a Friday night, we agreed together that we, we should try and pursue this call, even if it meant doing an internship in the church, which gave paid £4,000 a year, which was a bit, uh, you know, not going to be very wise um, financially. And then um, that Saturday morning, we got a call with someone offering to buy all the shop stock. Um, and so in about two weeks, it was a week to two weeks, we the debt was pretty much gone. The shop stock was gone from the house. Um, council job was finished and I was um, doing this mad internship for a church that ended up being for three years and still only four thousand pounds <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. yeah. yeah yeah it doesn't pay to go into the church does it, it? does not pay <laughs> uh, no I mean this end of things are definitely more comfortable than I've been and I think you know being from an estate uh, we knew like what it what it would be to to have less and it was not really that much of a worry mm -hmm. um and and the um you know obviously want to feel called to uh be a priest is one thing but what about the decision to enter estate ministry was that always the intention uh, you know were, were were people challenging about what 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 your future roles might look like just just share a bit of that if you would sophie yeah, I think there's like, oh, there's so much about it. Well, I obviously I do the at estate underscore ministry Twitter and or X, whatever you want to call it, um, and that's because there was a bit of pushback like around it. So people had, I went, mean, you know, people said things like, "Haven't you grown out of the estate? You know, like, haven't you, 
had done that kind of thing um there was a sense of like that it would perhaps be easier um in a kind of different context which i don't know if that's true um but it wouldn't be easier for me so i think for me yes it has always been the estate i can't um how do i explain it it feels like pe that wherever i go whatever estate i'm on wherever council estate i'm on it feels like i'm home it feels like i'm with my people um that we can be honest and be who we are um i i did um placements in other contexts and i served curacy in a very different context um and that's okay felt like you know it was okay and i learned a lot but it but it wasn't where the call lies and for me it is the states um they're the best where would you want to go anywhere else <laughs> yeah well I, you know it's 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 really interesting you say that i mean people you know i'm a lot older than you uh and people say to me oh you know it's hard on the coal face and all that and why don't you go and get yourself a a little leafy lane vicarage somewhere but I, I think what you said hits the nail on the head it's like it feels like home mm -hmm. you know it, it it is it is tough but it's a it's a nice tough i once interviewed a footballer who, who used to play for a, a club where the training ground was falling apart and he said you know you go to work and there's damp and it's it's miserable and there's a few issues he said but it's our damp it's our <laughs> it's our misery you know and I, and uh, i found it was quite you know, it was, it was funny what he'd said, but I think there's some truth in that. You know, it's, it is home, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And there are struggles, and but there's a, like, there's an integrity in the struggle um, and there's a creativity um, that is required when you don't have all, all the kind of financial resources. You need to get kind of, and you need to get really reliant on God. And I think, Obviously, there's the the horrendous side of that when you you know people don't have their their basic needs are not met, and there's a very serious side to that. Um, but I think um, there's something about being compelled continually to step out in faith and and to find answers together, and not to be content like that this is our lot, and you know people will, you know don't have enough, but we could do something as a community. We can and we do. So there's something about imitating the the way in which christ moves through the gospels from place to place you know making the use of what is there um in in the setting um that i see on estates and i think that that feels really valuable so so tell our listeners sophie about estate ministry tell us about first of all i mean you know uh, this i think there's two sides there are challenges and there are the joys Perhaps start with the, the challenges, if you would, that, you know, that are really kind of very stark for you at, at this time of your ministry. Yeah, I think the challenges are the fear. So not, you know, recording, the, recording scripture all the time to not be afraid. But there is fear, um, you know, around not having enough, around, you know, particularly provision for children and, and wanting them to flourish um there's there's fear and animosity and, and an animosity can i get the word out and there's fear and animosity towards different kind of um marginalized groups and so that's a struggle and it can be a struggle to to want to see um people really love and serve one another regardless of background um and actually we see that where we are um incredibly we run a food pantry which um is obviously an awful thing to have to run um but it it's an opportunity for people of all faiths and none to come together and we really do make it a kind of community social event so whilst we're we all know we'd rather that didn't have to be a, an option um we do see something of the kingdom in that um that place and particularly when it is run as it is here by people who live locally and um who are facing those struggles themselves so we 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 stand side by side and i think that's hard um and also wonderful at the same time so you know with the heating issues that are that people will face this winter um really concerning there are lots of grants there are lots of um you know things we can apply for people who want to support 
but the systemic problems remain. Um, and I think for when you're when you're doing a state ministry, um, and I don't think that's just the role of the ordained minister. I think that's our whole ministry team here, lay and ordained. And when we're doing a state ministry, there's this kind of um, it's kind of like the accepted norm that we should always have our hands out. And I find that insulting. Um, and, you know, you just have to apply for the grant because you have to approve that you're going to be sensible with the money. Um, and I kind of can understand that on one on one hand. And then on the other, I think, you know, if you, <laughs> like we have people in need here, it's statistically proven, like we're doing something good about it. What, you know, why should we have to beg? Um, yeah, I struggle with that. I think it's a really uh, important point you're raising, Sophie. I think um, what you say, having your hands out, is 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 very real for us as well. We get we get given nothing, yeah. <laughs> and we have to apply for everything. Yeah. And even with uh, we, we're very blessed, Sophie, that we have somebody who's doing the same role that you're doing here. Uh, a, a wonderful priest called uh, Reverend Cat Gregory with him who is uh, with us for a period of five years. She was the curate, so it's, it's a little bit longer. But even in that, we have to justify or kind of explain what's in it for other people, yeah. you know? So one of the things somebody said to us was, you know, if we give you this person, if we give you Cat for five years, uh, what what will it look like? You know, will will that bring more money in? uh to the church on the plate because you've got the person and we kind of know uh <laughs> you know that that's not what we're doing it for and, and and one of the questions we were asked is you know how how much do you think uh these people might put on the plate and and a lot of our people come to our church and put nothing on the plate because they 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 haven't got that disposable income and then of course like you say you then got to apply for the grant and you're in the you're in the hands of others, literally in the hands of others, uh, whether your work is deemed adequate or suitable enough. And it is a real challenge, isn't it? Yeah. And the time consumption, like, you know, to, t to do those grants and then to follow up. And you know, this week I'll be following up with a grant to say, like, these are the things, these are the outcomes of the money that you've sent us. And it doesn't seem... I've, I understand it's like part of the you know what charity commission might expect potentially and that the, there's legalities around it but it just feels very much like you say you know how much is this going to gain us financially how many you know disciples are going to be made that's a good question um as long as it's not just you know if the underlying question isn't how much money is going to come in um I think it's disingenuous to call it ministry um, if it's only financial motivations um, and yeah we have we have received so many grants and I am grateful I feel like it's one of those things where I don't want to be ungrateful um, but the pressure it puts on clergy and mm. ministry teams mm. to to jump through those hoops um, along with a ministry which is very unpredictable um, it is very intense because um people are really really struggling um you know it's it, it's just yeah i don't see it being very justifiable i think probably we need a new model yeah well i, I would definitely agree with that um so if we can move if we can move on to people yeah. and we will come back to the joys because I, I i know i know there are i don't even need to say all that i know there are um, what about the people in terms of um, the potential that you see in people is probably the thing I'd like to to explore with you. I mean, I've got this running thing with, you know, for my for my sins, I'm on general synod and trying to push through this, uh, I, this vocation uh, for people from the working class. Um, there's an, and, I, and, and something I constantly get from uh, clever people is that you know uh, working class what is what does it mean what is it you know working class people are academic they can be but there's also another model to that what was your kind of assessment of the way we 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 treat people who who we might want to develop um i think that so what i think is that um people who are working class are 
equally academic or practical as to the middle class or upper class. Um, I think that that um, there's a snobbery in in the kind of um, ministerial formation process uh, that assumes that middle class people will be academic, that which irritates me. Um, and I think that that actually the streams as a whole need to be overhauled and there need to be just practical routes and um, routes of which are more bookish. I wouldn't even say academic because I think that the, the practical is still academic. Um, as you can tell by the mess of my study, like I probably should have sorted that out beforehand. I do love books and there are lots of people I know who love books, but my husband's a carpenter. Um, his theological insights are just as um, important as anyone else's. Um, and and the people I see on estates, they know God, like in a way the church needs to know God. Um, and so I think, yeah, the there needs to be a, a, a bigger overhaul. It, it, making kind of accessible routes for working class people is really important. Um, but it, it's just like scratching the surface, I think, of a, of a wider problem. And there are middle class people I know and upper class people. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> um, <laughs> who um, who like I could do with a practical route. Like, you know, for them, college was a struggle for them. You know, I, it, it wasn't um, I never felt inferior in college academically. Um, and I think that that's that people might have expected me to. Um, and that is one of those things where it's, you know, it's obvious that this issue of class needs to be discussed properly and fully and not just always moving the goalposts and it's something I'm looking at in my PhD, like, you know, people on estates know they're working class. Like, why do we pretend it doesn't exist? Like, why is there a sense the church wants to pretend that it doesn't exist? Um, is it because it makes everyone feeling comfortable about the amount of wealth they have probably <laughs> yeah i think i think probably i think one of the other things that i i have identified in my time here is that uh quite often um people who have been kind of uh suppressed that they, they don't recognize the talents that they have you know i i really do see enormous potential and, and you know as my book there so people will know that I've, I've worked for Argos for 20 years so and I used to love I used to love nothing more Sophie than somebody coming through the door as a Christmas temp you know a fancy dress shop worker or whatever and going wow this person's got got something we can't possibly let them go and then three or four years down the line they're, they're a store manager or they're <clears throat> being highly successful and I think our estates are awash with these people. Is that something you would concur with? Absolutely. I think um, I think it's another another thing that needs to be dealt with in terms of ministerial formation is this um, the willingness to see other people's light shine brighter than our own, um, and and class is just another layer in which people can kind of be held back. Uh, and yeah, they're the some of the brightest, most able people I know are from estates with in you know with the, the integrity. Integrity is like a, just such a key word for me. Like mm. they really live their faith um, in a way in which the church needs as in term in their leadership. Uh, so yeah, I think we definitely we definitely see we see people who are more like who Jesus would choose <laughs> like and does choose um, and and the church sometimes some somehow struggles with that yeah yeah I, I have this kind of mantra that we, you know we really need to be the church of England and not the church in it and I, and I kind of I kind of hang on that one because mm -hmm. um because I also feel Sophie again I mean just know what you think that that, that there is real potential for growth in these communities as well that that may be uh, you know, I find with a lot of people that that come to our church, they they don't have, uh, goodness me, we've just at the beginning we talked about the historical abuse in the church. These people come almost with a clean slate, so they they maybe haven't had a long standing connection, but they've come to the church because they've seen it as a place of sanctuary or they see it as a place of safety and and trust, and therefore uh, they're very open minded about about how the church can evolve it, it do you 
Do you agree with that in your experience? So I find that people are, the people I meet anyway, um, who come to faith maybe a bit later on in the estate, some of them, you know, like they've been Christians their whole life and um, they, they for just similarly to anyone else, they were baptised and, you know, that was what they assumed they were. Um, and maybe the faith bubbles up more as the years go on. But those who come and maybe at a later stage, um, I think there's that kind of, the zealousness like the kind of like they're zealous for christ and um loud <laughs> and so rightly loud and so i think what we we have is this moment of opportunity where they really will be prophets um, and they really will call out injustice i think i think there's a mixture of that kind of yes is yes maybe a clean slate but also and maybe that clean slate means um they don't have the baggage of like deference <laughs> and they don't have the baggage of like um, pretense. So they just say it how they see it. And I, I just love it. I think that's, we need more of it. Yeah. yeah. Sophie, it's been, it'd be lovely to get an insight into your, your working life there. What, uh, and what are the overriding joys? What, what is it that kind of you, when you get up in the morning that excites you and, and thrills you about, about life on the estate? I I love um, just watching people flourish and that the church is a place in which people can flourish in a, in a culture um, that is often demonised and thought less of um, by the media and by society as a whole. I love that the church is a place where people can be who God has called them to be. And, and that is amazing that they, that, they love God and they they know that whatever label is stuck on them um, by anyone else means nothing because of who has called them by name. And so I think that that is, it's just, we have, I know we've got to finish, um, but we have like a, a leadership kind of um, course here um, and just watching people through that come to to have confidence in themselves to reinstate that value that was always there and should have always been there. That's the joy of a state ministry. Um, and of course, knowing Jesus is the best gift we have to offer. So yeah, like who, who doesn't want this job? Ta like apply. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Sophie, you, you've sold it to me uh, and, <laughs> and I hope you've sold it to others. And, and uh, um, I, I think the the people who do work in our context, love it and would agree with everything you said. I think there's a bit of work perhaps to do with people who don't work in that context and show them how wonderful it is um, because uh, you've clearly expressed that really beautifully. So I'm really grateful for your time uh, today, Sophie, and thanks for coming on the Godcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me.